Part 5 of This is the End by Stella Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Peter Eastman. Next morning, the admirer, twittering with excitement, came in upon the family while it was having its breakfast. Oh, I had such an idea in the night, she said. I couldn't sleep, of course, after such an exciting day. I believe I have been fated to help you in your quest. I know of a house near here, and the more I think of it, the more sure I feel that it is the place you want. Who lives there? A young man with his mother. I forget the name. Place we want's west, objected Mr. Russell. You never can tell, said Anonyma. This place may stand on a salient facing west. Our search must be thorough. It's such a lovely walk, said the admirer. I should be so much honored if you would let me show you the way. Oh, I say, do you think me very presumptuous? Her self-consciousness took the form of a constant repentance. In the night she would go over her day and probe it for tender points. Oh, that was a dreadful thing to say, was a refrain that would keep her awake for hours, wriggling and giggling in her bed over the dreadfulness of it. She had too little egoism. The lack gave her face a look of littleness. A lack of altruism has the same outward effect. A complete face should be full of something, of gentleness, of vigor, of humor, of wickedness. The admirer's face was only half full of anything. All the same, there was charm about her. The fact that she was an admirer was charming. Mrs. Gustus reassured her. We shall be most grateful for a guide. We should be even more grateful for an excuse to call on this inoffensive young man and his mother at eleven o'clock in the morning, objected Q. He ought to be at the front, was the excuse provided by Cousin Gustus. So ought I, sighed Q. Oh, but you're wounded, aren't you? asked the admirer. There were signs of a possible transfer of admiration, and Mrs. Gustus interposed with presence of mind. We'll start, she said. Don't let's be hampered in the beginning of our quest by social littleness. She was conscious that she looked handsome enough for any breach of convention. She wore an unusual shaped dress, the color of vanilla ice. Instead of doing her hair as usual in one severe penny bun at the back, she had constructed a half-penny bun, so to speak, over each ear. This is a very literary way of doing the hair, and the remembrance of the admirer haunting Anonyma's waking thoughts had inspired the change. Their way lay through the beechwood that embroiders the hem of the down's cloak. There are only two colors in a beechwood after rain, lilac and green. A bank of violets is not more pure in color than a beech trunk shining in the sun. The two colors answered one another, fainter and fainter, away and away, to the end of one's sight, and there were two cuckoos, hidden in the dream, mocking each other in velvet voices. The view between the trees was made up of horizons that tilted one's chin. The bracken, very young, on an opposite slope, was like a cloud of green wings alighting. But the look of their destination disappointed them. "'This house faces south,' said Q. "'I feel sure,' began Mr. Russell, but Mrs. Gustus said, "'As we are here, we might ask. To be sure, the cliff is rather tame.' "'But there is an aeroplane,' persisted the admirer. "'Now pause, Anonyma,' Hugh warned her. "'Pause and consider what you are going to say.' "'Consideration only unearths difficulties,' laughed Anonyma. "'Best go forward in faith and fearlessness.' She was under the impression that she constantly laughed in a nicely naughty way at Q's excessive conventionality. 
as they drew nearer to the cliff it grew tamer and tamer. The house, too, became dangerously like a villa, a super-villa to be sure, and not in its first offensive youth, but still closely connected with the villa tribe. Its complexion was a bilious yellow, and it had red-rimmed windows. It was close to the sea, however, and its windows, with their blinds drawn down against the sun, looked like eyes downcast towards the beach. There was no lodge, and the family walked in silence through the gate. Mr. Russell's hound went first with a defiant expression about his tail. That expression cost him dear. Inside the gate there stood a large, vulgar dog, without a tail to speak of. Its parting was crooked, its hair was in its eyes. All these personal disadvantages the family had time to note, while the dog gazed incredulously at Mr. Russell's hound. A Pekingese dog never wears country clothes. It always looks as if it had its silk hat and spats on. If I were a country dog who had never even smelt a Piccadilly smell, I should certainly bite all dogs of the type of Mr. Russell's hound. I could hardly describe what followed as a fight. Although I have always loved stories of giant killers from David downwards, and should much like to write one, I cannot in this case pretend that Mr. Russell's hound did anything but call for help. Anonyma's umbrella, Q's cane, and Mr. Russell's stick did all they could towards making peace, but the big dog seemed to have set itself the unkind task of mopping up a puddle with Mr. Russell's hound. The process took a considerable time, and it was never finished, for the mistress of the house interrupted it. She was rather a fat person, apparently possessing the gift of authority, for the sound of her call reached her dog through the noise of battle. He saw that his aim was not one to achieve in the presence of an audience. He disengaged his teeth from the mane of Mr. Russell's hound. "'Is your dog much hurt?' asked the mistress of the house, and handed Anonyma a slate. Anonyma scanned this unexpected gift nervously. She was much more used to taking other people aback than to being taken aback herself. But Q was more ready. He dived for the pencil and wrote, only a bit punctured, on the slate. "'You'd better bring it in and bathe it,' suggested the lady when she had studied this. They followed her in silent single file. Anonyma noticed that her hair was apparently done in imitation of a pigeon's nest, also that many hooks at the back of her dress had lost their grip of the situation. The bathroom, whither Mr. Russell's hound was carried, was suggestive of another presence in the house. A boat, called Golden Mary, was navigating the bath. There were some prostrate soldiers and chessmen in a little heap on the ledge, apparently waiting for a passage. "'I'm getting out my son's things, because he is coming home,' said the lady. Mr. Russell was bathing his bleeding hound in the basin, and Anonyma was at the window, ostentatiously drinking in the view. Q took the slate and wrote politely on it, "'From school?' "'From the war,' said the lady. Q donned a pleased and interested expression. It seemed to him better to do this than to write, really, on the slate. "'He wrote about a fortnight ago,' the lady's harsh voice continued, "'to say he would come to-day. He said he was sick of being grown up. He told me to get out the soldiers and the Golden Mary.' He wants to launch them on the pond again. Q nodded. I have felt like that, he murmured, and the lady seemed to see the sense of his words. I should think you are six years older than Murray, she said, and very different. Come out into the garden, and I'll show you. Q followed her, and Anonyma, after a moment's hesitation, went too. But Mr. Russell, who had finished his work of mercy, 
seemed to think it better to linger in the bathroom, explaining to his hound the subject of a biblical picture which hung over the bath. "'You might think I was rather too old to play things well,' the mother said to Q, "'but you should see me with Murray. Even my deafness never hindered me with him. I could always see what he said. Look, we made this road for the soldiers coming down to the wharf. Do you see the way we helped nature by tampering with the roots of the beach? It is a perfect wharf, this little flat bit. It is just level with the deck of the boat at high tide. The lower wharf is for low tide, but of course we have to pretend the tides. That round place is the bandstand, and there the pipers play when there is a troop ship starting. Sometimes only the favorite piper plays, striding up and down the little bowling green at the top here, but not often, because the work of keeping him going interferes with the disembarkation. We never let the Highlanders go abroad, because Murray loves them so. He is afraid lest something should happen to them. Were the Highlanders your favorites? Q wrote on the slate, No, the Egyptian Camel Corps. The lady nodded. We loved them, too, but of course they lived on the other side of the pond, and sometimes they and the sepoys and the Sudanese had to insurrect. Somebody had to, you know, but we regretted the Egyptian Camel Corps awfully. I hope you don't think us silly. Murray was always a childish person. I hope I am, too. The Bowling Green gave us a lot of trouble to make. It is nice and flat, isn't it? We trim it with nail scissors. It was a good Bowling Green, about twelve inches by six. There were some marbles on it. It has historical associations, said the mother of Murray. It was here that Drake played when the Armada was sighted. Of course, that was before our time. But sometimes, on a moonlit summer night, we used to lie down on our fronts and see his little ghost haunting the green. We used to bring our young sailors here and inspire them with stories about Drake. The sailors used to stand on the green, and we put up railings made of matches all round, and civilians used to stand in great breathless crowds outside the railings watching. Chessmen, of course. Murray used to make the civilians arrive in motors so as to make ruts in the road. Somehow it was always rather splendid and real to have ruts in the road. There was a long pause. Later on, of course, things got more grown up. The last time we played before the war, when war was already in sight, we shipped an unprecedented mass of troops to that peninsula and had a wonderful battle. You can still see the trenches and gun emplacements. I cleared them out yesterday. Murray joined the army in that first August, and whenever he came home after that he was somehow ashamed of these things. I quite understood that. When I am having tea with the vicar's wife, or cutting out shirts for the soldiers, I sometimes blush a little to think how old I am, and to think of the things I do at home with Murray. I am sure he felt just the same when he was with other men. But his last letter was young again. He wrote that the war should cease the moment he set foot inside this gate, and we would have a civilian game, an alpine expedition up the mountains. You see the beech root mountains. There is the cave where we put up for the night. There is a wonderful view from Bumpy Peak, over the sea and right away to far-off lands. Murray thought that when the expedition had caught a chamois it might turn into engineers, prospecting for the building of a road up to Bumpy Peak, so that the soldiers might march up and look out over the sea and see, very far off, the fringes of the east that they had conquered when they were young and not tired of war. She broke off and looked at Q. Anonyma stood a few paces away, gazing at her vanilla ice reflection in the pond. I dare say you think us silly, said the lady. I dare say you would think Murray a rotter if you met him. It doesn't matter much. It doesn't matter at all. Nothing matters, because he will come home tonight. Hugh fidgeted a moment, 
and then took the slate, and wrote, I am very much afraid that all leave from abroad has been stopped this week. Yes, I know, said the mother. I have been unhappy about that for some days, but it doesn't make any difference to Murray now. You see, I heard last night that he was killed on Tuesday. That's why I know he will come, and I shall be waiting here. Can't you imagine them shouting as they get through, as they get through with being grown up, shouting to each other as they run back to their childhood and their old pretenses? After a moment she added, That is the only sound that I shall ever hear now, the shouting of Murray to me as he runs home. It was in a sort of dream that Q watched Anonyma go forward and take both the hands of the mother. I suppose he knew that all that was superfluous, and that Murray would come home. Anonyma said, I am so sorry, I am so sorry that we intruded, you must forgive us. The mother of Murray did not hear, but she saw that sympathy was intended, and she nodded awkwardly and a little severely. I don't think she had known that Anonyma was there. Q was not sorry that he had intruded. At sunset, when the high sea span about the rocks a web of foam, I saw the ghost of a Cornishman come home. I saw the ghost of a Cornishman run from the weariness of war. I heard him laughing as he ran across his unforgotten shore. The great cliff, gilded by the west, received him as an honored guest. The green sea, shining in the bay, did drown his dreadful yesterday. Come home, come home, you million ghosts, the honest years shall make amends. The sun and moon shall be your hosts, the everlasting hills your friends. And some shall seek their mother's faces, and some shall run to trysting places, and some to towns, and others yet shall find great forests in their debt. Oh, I would siege the golden coasts of space and climb high heaven's dome, so I might see those million ghosts come home. End of Part 5